We're going through three things. What did Pastor Chuck talk about? They talked about the word, right? The importance of the word. And so we said there's three things that cause a Christian to grow. You got to have all three of these things or else you don't grow, right? So the first one is an auth- or is a strong personal relationship with God. The best way to get to know God is how? How? Read the Bible. You got you to gotta read what he said, right? You could find out his character in the Bible. We got to pray, right? We have to spend time in communion with him. What we did this morning, this, this worship, is part of our personal relationship with God. And so um, all of those things are important. <clears throat> so that's the first one. Last week, you remember what we talked about? Still not jogging your memory? What do we do at the end? Certainly you guys remember that. Yeah. So we talked about relationships, right? We have to have authentic relationships with other believers. That's the second thing. Strong personal relationship with God, authentic relationship with other believers. And when going through kind of this lens, that we were made in his image, right? That's what we talked about. We were made in God's image. It says that in Genesis. It's right here. We'll read that again. We read this last week, but just to kind of refresh our memories. Said then God said, Let us make man in our image. Isn't it interesting that says us? And our? You ever notice that? Let us make man in our image. And so when we talk about the whole rest of the Bible talks about there's just one God, right? There's just one God. And right here we see evidence of the Trinity, right? We see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right from the beginning, speaking to each other in perfect communion saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Then let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock of the earth, over all the creeping things that creep along the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so we have this creation event that God created people in his image. See that? And then what happened? Then what happened in chapter 3? I'm going to make you guys tell me. (laughs) Huh? The first sin. The fall, right? The crash. Everything changed. And we forgot who we were. We forgot who we were. Kim always says we're princes and princesses with amnesia, right? I was thinking about this this week. You know, what's the pinnacle of human existence? What's the best thing that could ever happen to you? Let me go back here. Pinnacle of human existence. Being saved. That's the right answer. That is the right answer. The world has a lot of other answers, though, doesn't it? Like, I think about, like, <coughs> Usain Bolt. You remember him running the Olympics? Fastest man in history. Like not just in the world at the time, the fastest man in all of human history, Usain Bolt. Like he was at the pinnacle of the sport. No one could beat him. No one could touch him. No one could even come close. And a lot of people would say that was the pinnacle of human existence. He was the best at what he did, the absolute best, or LeBron James. Yeah, he's the best basketball player in the world, in my opinion, and in most people's opinion, I think. The pinnacle of basketball. No one's better than him. He's at the top. And I think as men, we kind of identify that th- with that, don't we? Like, like Brandon, you're at the steel mill, and you're like, I'm the best worker here. And you can walk around and just, I'm the best. I'm at the pinnacle of my existence right now, yeah? And I could walk around and say I'm the best insurance agent, but that would certainly not be true. Uh, Luke can attest. Uh, (laughs) Think of people like Warren Buffett and Carlos Slim and Bill Gates. They have the most money in the world. They could do almost anything that they want. They want to buy 100 helicopters? Let's do this thing. They want to build their own army? They could probably fund it. They're at the pinnacle of wealth. Is that the pinnacle of existence? You look at Donald Trump and Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, they're like this, 
the most powerful people in the world. More control over more power than any other people. Like, is that the pinnacle of human existence? In high school, you know, who's the best looking person? Or who's the most popular? We go off of all those things. More practical things, you know, getting married. Like when I found my mate, that was a good day, right? It was a great day. How about the day your kids were born? What an awesome day. What an awesome day. All of them, right, Marcy? All of them. And yet in all those things, according to Ecclesiastes and according to all of us, compared to salvation, it's meaningless. It's vanity, isn't it? I mean, without salvation, without Jesus, without redemption, all the rest is worth nothing in comparison. That's hard to say, right? It's hard to say that about our own family about our own kids, but it's that important. It's that important. Jesus said this at one point, Mark chapter 8, verse 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And we have to do that as businesses every year. We have to figure out our profit, right? And so we take all of our income, and we subtract all of our expenses, and hopefully at the end, that's a positive number, right? And Jesus is saying, look at this thing like a business. I could give you all of the things in the world on this side, and I could put your soul on this side, and the scales would totally be in favor of your soul. It wouldn't even be close. It wouldn't even be close. Our soul is that important. It would be such a loss for us to lose our soul and gain everything. And yet on the other hand, when we've received salvation, when our our soul is saved, all of the other things, all of the other things are so much less of a value, aren't they, in comparison. Hopefully we have that mindset. If you don't, my goal is to change that mindset this morning. I want you to value Jesus and value salvation beyond anything else because that's when everything else falls into place. See, it's not that kids aren't important. I love my kids. I love my kids more than anything else in this world other than my wife and other than my God. But it has to be in balance. It has to be in order. It must be the salvation of your soul that's the pinnacle of human existence. To come into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. John nailed it right away. Ruined the whole first 10 minutes of the sermon. Thanks, buddy. No, good job, good job. That's our problem, though, isn't it? You know, we still chase after things in this world, don't we? And yet if I would ask you, you know, like you all want a million dollars, right? If I had a million dollars, you guys would all be okay with taking it? (laughs) Tara, Tara's the only one doesn't want it. Anyone want Tara's million? Yeah, I'll take it, right? I'd gladly take a million. But if I said... Okay, I'll give you a million, but you got to give me your eye. You got to give me your right eye. Worth it? <laughs> oh, you'll get, you'll so you'll give me that one. How about both of them? How about both your eyes? Both your eyes worth a million? Ten million? Hundred million? It's not worth it, right? How about your feet? How much is your feet worth? Huh? You'd give me yours? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you might regret that decision. <laughs> and yet we recognize the value of our own bodies, the value of our senses and our sight. But how much do we value our soul? Hmm. Something to think about. The pinnacle of human existence, the greatest thing you could ever accomplish is to be a child of God to come into a right relationship with the Father through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, to come to a realization of your sins and to repent and to turn away from all those things you chase in this world and to run to the cross and to believe in all that Jesus has done for you. 
That's the highest and best place you could be. The sermon's kind of in reverse, and so that's okay. So how do we get to the highest and best place? Well, it comes from being in the lowest. It comes from being in the lowest place you could be. That's where most of us got saved, isn't it? When you came to that realization of your sins, when you realized that you couldn't be good enough, how wicked you were. I was at the lowest of low points in my life when I came to God. And that's where he wants us. Because that's where our hearts are broken. That's where he can change us. Not when we're prideful. It's submission. It's humility. It's sorrow where God works. And through that we get power, we get identity, and we get joy. Isn't that interesting? Like we give submission, we get power. How does that work? Only in the kingdom. We give humility, we get identity. We give up ourselves, we give up who we are, and God gives us who we are. Isn't that interesting? We give him sorrow over our sin. He gives us back joy. How amazing. So if we've experienced such a thing, then what's the point of the rest of life? <laughs> That's what I was thinking about this week. You, know, you ever meet the, like, a, a person who was like the football player in high school? Like they were the best. They were the man. And then you meet them 10 years later, after all the football is done and all the lights are off. If they don't know God, it's almost like this emptiness in their life. Like they've, like they've reached the pinnacle, and now it's like, now what? What's the point? Or you remember like your first girlfriend or boyfriend? Some of you married your first girlfriend or boyfriend, but I'm talking even like your first crush in like second grade. You remember that? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. And then how heartbroken were you when they didn't <laughs> decide to, to like you back or when that thing ended? You remember like the emptiness, the pain inside? And you thought, there's no one in the world as good as that person. They were the best. They were the pinnacle. And then you live life, right? And you realize it wasn't the end of the world, that there was someone better out there for you. But salvation is so much greater than those things, right? It's greater than the first crush. It's greater than the Friday night lights. So what do we do after that experience? Yeah, that's the best. The day of salvation is the best. Like, I can't talk about it without jumping up and down. It was so good. I can remember that experience, walking out of my house the next morning after crying myself to sleep, and it was like, it was like the Wizard of Oz after they turned the color on. It was that good. It was that good. So where do you go from there? Luckily, Jesus, in his great wisdom, he didn't leave us without something to do. <clears throat> He's left us with plenty to do, right? And so I want to convince you of what we should be doing as the people of God. Because in our minds, how it should be is we reach the pinnacle and then we just go right to heaven, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be the best? But there's more work to do. So what's the point of going on? Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to read some, some before this for some context. Paul says this. He says, Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now and always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And so when Paul is writing to the Philippians, he is writing from jail. He's jailed in Rome. He doesn't know if he'll ever get out. He believes at this point that he'll still be delivered. But it's not a good place. And yet he's still rejoicing. He says, I will rejoice. Then verse 21, he says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor, labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two, 
My desire is to, be, to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And so Paul felt this tension, the same tension that I hope that you feel. Like he had reached the pinnacle of existence. He had reached salvation in Jesus Christ. It says at one point he told people that he was carried up to the third heaven. And yet, he said, for you, it's better that I stay. Because Jesus still had work for Paul, didn't he? Jesus still had service for Paul. And that's where we're going, out, going today. The word here uh, that Paul uses a little bit later on in Philippians and again in Timothy is this word spendo. <laughs> spendo, that's an easy one to pronounce. To be poured out as a drink offering is the word. It's used a couple of different times. Philippians 2.14 says this, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights of the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in, va in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. And so this word spendo, it had a couple different possible meanings. In the Old Testament, there was a drink offering that you would give with your sacrifice. And so you'd bring an animal to be sacrificed for your sins, and then you'd also bring some flour, which they would make into bread that would be part of the sacrifice. And then you would bring some wine, and in some cases some oil, that would be part of the sacrifice. And they would pour that wine over the altar, and it would create a, a, a steam. Uh, a fragrance to the Lord as part of the drink offering. And so Paul could be pointing to that. There was also in the pagan religions, they would do animal sacrifices to their gods and they would also pour out wine. And so we're not quite sure because the Philippians were like, a, it was like a pagan city. And so Paul could have been talking in a way that they would have understood and s said, you know, if, if that's my job is to be poured out for your faith, if, if my blood is to be poured out as a drink offering for your faith, so be it, I rejoice in it. I rejoice in it. And then he says this in Timothy, a little bit more, uh, more sure of what's going to happen to him. He says, as for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. And so Paul is a little bit more sure of what's going to happen to him, and he did. He was killed in that Roman prison. He did die as a martyr of the faith in captivity, and his life was poured out. But his life was being poured out before that, wasn't it? All of our lives are being poured out to some extent, aren't they? I think that word, interesting, it's spendo. <laughs> and I, don't, I couldn't trace it back to the word spend in English. I was trying to link the two. Uh, but there's, they must be linked somehow. But you go back and study this word, it doesn't, it doesn't link well to the English language, to be poured out as a drink offering. Like, we don't talk that way, right? <coughs> But how are you going to spend your life? You know? You're going to be poured out to something. Whether he was talking about the pagan altar, the worldly altar, so to speak, or the spiritual altar, the altar of God, you're going to be poured out somewhere. We're all advancing forward a minute at a time, an hour at a time. All of our lives are being spent. The time that you're spending in here we speak that way don't we you're spending time in here this is an hour of your life that you'll never get back and so how are we going to pour out our lives will it be for him or will it be for the world that's the choice i want you to make this morning this is back to philippians 1 
Sorry, bear with me here. I got my notes all mixed up. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but also of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And so Paul I love that first line, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so I want you to ask yourselves some questions this morning as we go through. You don't have to answer them now, but think about these as we continue. Number one, like we talked about earlier, would you rather be here or would you rather be with Jesus? With Jesus? Amen, sister. (laughs) I'd rather be with Jesus too. Even though I have all of these good times ahead, right? I have little children. I'm going to get to see them grow up and hopefully graduate and get married. Maybe I'll have grandkids someday if Jesus tarries and if uh, people are still having kids at that point. It's going down slowly, but um, yeah. So many glories to come, and yet it doesn't compare with the glory of Jesus, does it? And so we're torn. Like, I know that there's still work to do in Wick City. I don't feel like I'm done. I don't feel like, I feel like God's still got some preaching left to do with me, you know? I still got a few songs left to play. I still got a few yards left to cut in the community. (laughs) I don't feel like I'm done yet. And so I feel like I want to be here too. And so we should feel that tension. I want you to feel that tension. We should all feel that tension. We want to be with God, but we want to do some more service here. Amen? With me? Number two. Is the enemy unhappy that you're still around, or is he glad you're still here? This is a little harder for me, right? (laughs) You think he's glad I'm still here? I don't want him to be glad I'm still here. I want the enemy to be upset that I'm here. Okay, all right. I hear you there. I hear you there. I want him to rejoice when I die. I want him to be like, Thank goodness he's finally gone. (laughs) Like when I wake up in the morning, I want him to be like, oh, no, what's he going to do today? That's how I want him to think about me. And I don't want him to be glad I'm still here. I want to be so strong in the faith that he knows that he can't do anything to me. That he knows that I'm going to be storming the gates every single day. Trying to plunder his kingdom. And that's how I want all you to feel. Like we're warriors. Like we sing that song, there's an army rising up to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. You remember that? You believe that? We'll talk about that at the end too. Number three, is the life you're living worthy of the gospel of Christ? How great is the gospel of Christ? We talked about how great the salvation of a soul, the gospel of Christ is the reason for that salvation. Our life should be trying to live up to that. I don't know if that's possible. Even for Paul, I don't know if it was possible. But certainly we should be striving for it. Amen? Amen. Let's look at a few other scriptures. This is Jesus now. What did Jesus have to say about this? Sorry. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? Remember what's happening here? This is at the Last Supper. Jesus takes off of his robe and he goes around and he washes all the disciples' feet. Can you imagine? The King of glory, the King of kings and Lord of lords sitting down and washing your feet, Tara. What a more humble place to be than to be washing someone else's feet. Do you understand what I have done to you, he says, like that the, that the greatest would lower himself to be the lowest. You have called me teacher and Lord, and you are right, 
for so I am. And so Jesus says, you called to be great. <laughs> you said I'm great. You said I'm the Lord, and you're right. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, so you also ought to wash each other's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And so no matter what heights that we grow to in our Christian relationship, and we do grow, right? We get better and better, hopefully. Hopefully you're, you feel like you're growing. And as you're reading the Word, as we're now reading the Word together, how are you guys doing in your reading plan? You doing okay? Getting there? It's hard? A little bit? Yeah? I, it's hard for me, too, to find the, the, even the five-minute times during the day. And before I know it, two hours have gone by. And now I need two chapters instead of one. Um, yeah, so hopefully you're, oh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out together, but there's grace there. And hopefully as you're doing life group together, right, we're all going to get connected into a group. We're going to live life together, and we're going to grow. And so as we're growing, it's important for us not to look down on people that are new believers or even to look down on unbelievers. Because no matter how bad of things that they're doing, no matter where they're at right now, that was you. I love that you said that this morning. The, the women who have chosen abortion, that, who have chosen against life, that's us. At one point, we chose against life. It was our own. And so we should value lives of even the unbelievers. Our greatest desire would be life for them, right? So no matter how high you achieve, no matter what level you get to, you're never too great to clean the toilets or to wash the feet or to mop the floors or to do any of the other dirty jobs that you think that you're above. Or not. Mark chapter 10. Just a little context here before we get to Scripture. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> That's pretty bold, isn't it? Like, would you ever walk up to Jesus and say that? Jesus, I want you to listen to me now. Whatever I say, I want you to do it, okay? How's that prayer work? No? <laughs> and Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. And Jesus said, you do not know what you are asking. <laughs> you got no idea, James and John. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, oh, yeah, we're able. Yeah. Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptize, baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but is for those of whom it has been, been prepared. And so Jesus says, this cup that he's going to drink, they're going to have to drink it too. The cup of death. And every one of the apostles was martyred with the exception of John, well, depending on who you study. Some people think John was also, but, um, but the vast majority of the apostles, no matter who you study, were martyred, were killed for the faith. Then we get to this scripture. <clears throat> Jesus called them to him, and he said to them, or sorry, there's one more verse there. When the ten heard it, they became, began to be indignant at James and John, and so they're upset with James and John. Maybe more upset that they didn't ask first. I'm not sure. To be at his right and his left. But they were upset. And then Jesus says this. He calls them to him and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life for the ransom of many. And so I think James and John had this idea that, hey, if we get to sit at his right and at his left, we're going to get to tell the other ten what to do when we get there. <laughs> we're going to be the kings and the rulers because that's all they ever saw, right? You look at Herod and you look at Pontius Pilate, and they got to tell each other what to, you know, they were the highest. 
When, people, when they said jump, they had to say how high. And you'd either jump or you'd be killed. And that's even how it works in our military. You know, you, you, you obey or you'll be punished. You'll be out. You, you follow commands. You follow the structure. But Jesus says, no, not in my kingdom. The ones that sit on my right and sit on my left, those are the ones that are going to be the slaves of everybody else. Everything's upside down. Everything's about this thing that we talk about every summer, but we kind of lose focus the other nine months. Everything is about service. It's about serving others. And that's what Jesus said. Even Jesus, even the Son of Man, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came not to be served. He didn't come so that everyone could come and lay everything at his feet. No, he came to serve everybody else. He came to give everything that he had, to pour everything that he had out for everything else, everyone else. Because his kingdom was not of this world. Just like our kingdom is not of this world. And so when we receive this pinnacle of salvation, our only concern for the rest of our lives is just to be to pour out everything that we have in service to everyone else so that some more might come to experience the experience that I experienced. Amen? You hear me this morning? Okay. Let's look at three things. You were made to serve. That's the reason that we're here. That's the reason that we're still here. There's no practical purpose for us to still be here after salvation. We should just go home and be with Jesus. But the whole rest of our life is wrapped up in this word, service. We're made to be poured out as a drink offering. So where will you be poured out? How will you be poured out? We'll give you a few different ideas here to start with. Are you with me this morning? Just say amen. amen. Okay, all right. Is this too hard? <laughs> I hope not. You were made to serve. Number one, start here. If you don't know where to start, start here. Service to each other. Service to each other. Always try to outserve one another. If we could get that through our in our mind, that we were always try to outserve one another wherever we were, no matter the situation, everything would change in here. Everything would change in your house. Like if you and your wife had a race every night to see who could do the dishes first. <laughs> I'm serious, you guys. I'm serious. We should be trying to outserve each other. Like, guys, you see some mess on the floor? Like, you should be racing to clean that mess up. I, want, I just want to save her some time. I just want to save her some energy. Whatever I can do to serve my wife, that's what I want to do. Whatever I can do, I'm going to pour it all out. That's what I'm here for. That's what my life's all about. It's not about me anymore. I got everything that I need. I got Jesus. Now I'm just pouring it out. And so when my wife goes to take a shower, like she can't shower during the day. Four kids, you can't shower. You can't do it. It's not even possible. Like you come out, two of them are going to be gone. <laughs> Probably three. And Abby might have Malachi on her back. They might all be gone. She loves that little baby. She'll take him anywhere. She'll drag him by his legs. So when she goes to shower and she hasn't been able to do the dishes and there's fold, clothes that need folded, I hustle. I try to finish it all by the time she gets out of the shower so that she can go, wow. She doesn't, but <laughs> I know that she likes it, though. But I'm not doing it to get brownie points or to get whatever. I just want to serve her. I just want to serve her. Same should be here. You know, when we're setting up tables, when we're taking down, putting up chairs, when we're doing whatever in the church, we should be racing each other. Racing each other to outserve each other. Because everything gets easier for everybody then, doesn't it? You feel good. Because you're fulfilling what God's called you to. You were made to do that. You were made to serve other people. And everyone else feels good because the load's been so lightened. And all of us are so humble in the experience. Because we're just doing it for Jesus. We're not trying to get kudos from anybody or anything. And so wherever you are, the workplace, this place, at your home, just do your best to outserve each other. 
Wives with unbelieving husbands, husbands with unbelieving wives, do your best to serve them. The Bible even says that that's how they'll come to salvation. You don't just berate them. Tell them, yeah, you never come to church. I can't believe you're such a heathen. That's not how to win people. The way you win people is to serve them. Amen? Amen. Number two, service to unbelievers. Everything matters. Absolutely everything matters. And this is where we're going to talk about volunteers. We were talking about this a little bit yesterday at the training that I was at. They told a story about a parking lot attendant. He was helping people park cars, okay? And I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but this one lady, she was ready to, she pulled in her car. It was pouring down rain, and she said, I'm not going to church today. I'm too far from the door. I'm, too, I'm upset already. I don't even want to be here in the first place. And some guy came up, opened her door, and had an umbrella. I put it right over her car and said, ma'am, I don't want you to get wet. Come on in. And so she, she followed him in. Walked all the way to the door. She said that someone was at the door, opened the door for her. She said, ne man, had never opened a door for her in her whole life. And she went to church, and she, she said she got saved that day. She got saved that day. And it wasn't the sermon. It wasn't any of that stuff that, that was the reason for her salvation. She said, I knew within two minutes. I didn't know anything that you guys believed. I didn't know the message. I didn't know the worship, but I knew I belonged here. I knew I belonged here. From a man with an umbrella and someone opening the door. How simple. How simple of a thing. Anyone could do that. Anyone could do that. And they change someone's life forever. Everything matters. When you're up there with the babies, a lot of people are scared of babies. When you're up there with the babies, you're reading a book to them. Might be the only time that they've ever heard about Jesus, that little baby. And you think it doesn't stick. Like you think they're too little, they're too young. And then these guys could probably attest as well as I can. They pick stuff up, don't they? You start reading the same book to them over and over again. Every Sunday morning you just have the same baby and you read them the same book about salvation in Jesus Christ. And pretty soon, first words out of their mouth, it seems like. As soon as they can talk, as soon as they can understand... They're repeating it back to you. Not only that, but as you're taking care of that baby, some mom gets to be down here, unhindered for an hour. And if you've never been there, you don't know what that means. But it's a great, great thing. And so when we call to more for more volunteers, we're not, we're not like just trying to badger you into it. We're trying to give you an opportunity to do what God has called you to do, which is to pour yourself out, which is to serve. Amen? You with me? So who wants to sign up for the babies? <laughs> See me after church. Everything matters. Everything matters. Lastly, service to the community. Lastly, but not leastly, service to the community. Our mission field at this church does not end at the doors of this building, okay? We love Sunday morning. Sunday morning is a great thing. People get saved on Sunday morning. People get changed on Sunday morning. I get it. I love it. It's great. But there's a reason that we go out and serve in the community because there's a lot of people that would never walk into the doors of this church. No matter how welcoming we are, no matter how loving we are, no matter how many times we open the door, no matter how many times we cover them with an umbrella coming from the car. They don't want anything to do with church. They got a bad taste in their mouth from church. They don't want to be here. In a lot of cases, I understand their, I understand their thoughts. But when we go out in the community and we start serving, Every blade of grass matters. Every paintbrush that you paint on a fence or on a porch matters. You're doing something to change the community. And when someone drives their car by, how many times has this happened? Some are served. Someone drives their car by and goes, what are y'all doing? <laughs> like, what, are, what the heck are you doing? Why would you be spending your Saturday this way? Like, are you guys city workers? We get that question a lot. Are you guys working for the city? Like, who's paying you? Nobody's paying us. We just want to love you. That's it. We just want to serve you. This is what God has called us to do. We are pouring ourselves out onto the city of Catani because that's what Jesus wants us to do. And so this is the third thing, you guys. This is the third thing you have to have in order to grow. Strong personal relationship with God. Authentic relationship with, with other people, other Christians, and lastly, a life of radical giving. A life of serving. Amen? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. 
Amen. You got saved the first week, didn't you? <laughs> Broke your car window. Biggest blessing of your life. Didn't feel like that at the time, did it? That's how God works. One man goes to serve, invites her to church. Here we are. That's awesome. We're just going to end here. Heard this yesterday, too. Totally stealing this, but loved it. Simon Peter replied, Jesus had said before this in Matthew chapter 16, who do, you, who do the people say that I am? Who do the people say that I am? And they said, well, some people say you're a prophet. Some people say this. Some people say that. And Peter said, and then Jesus said, well, who do, you, who do you say that I am? And Peter came back and he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I, I got to admit, I still don't understand this scripture fully. I just don't. Like, how could we have that much power? How could Jesus give us that much power? But he has. And I think when we can start to believe this stuff in our spirit, it will change the way that we do ministry. It will change the way that we talk to people. We think whenever we read this scripture, and I'm guilty of this, even up to yesterday, <laughs> but it says the gates of hell shall not prevail over it, it, it feels like we are in this castle of Christianity and we think the gates of hell are trying to come over and prevail against us. But it doesn't say that heaven's gates will never be broken down. It says that hell's gates can't stand. You see that? You see that? And so the picture is not, is not the kingdom of heaven on defense, trying to just hold on until Jesus comes back. That's not the picture here. The picture is God's people, the kingdom of heaven on offense, storming the gates of hell to take back God's people. Isn't that amazing? That's the picture. And so if we can get that mindset that when we do these things, it's offense. We're, we're on attack mode here. Like there's dark places in our city. How many of you know that, right? Our job is not to sit back and wait for them to come to us. Our job is to storm the gates of very hell. And go get them. Amen? So you got to plug in serving somewhere. <clears throat> Start in your house. Start today. Yeah. Race your spouse to do the dishes this afternoon from Sunday dinner. Try to outserve one another. Do your best to try to serve unbelievers. Realize that everything matters. Every open door, every kind word, it all matters. And find a way to serve in the community. When we have opportunities like yesterday, Pastor Luke, they did a trail cleanup. That matters. Every piece of garbage mattered yesterday. Right? Made a difference. Yeah. Nice. Many hands make light work. That's exactly what we're talking about, right? Beautiful. So find a way to plug in. If you want to serve anywhere in this church, please let me know. Uh, we have a new planning, it's called Planning Center Online, and so we can plug you in real, real easy at this point. Everything's electronic. You'll get email reminders of when you're supposed to serve. You don't have to remember. You don't have to do any of those kinds of things. It, it's automated. It's beautiful. And so we make it real easy to serve, real easy to plug you in. Amen? So find a way. Find a way to get started. I know I've talked a lot about the church this morning, and if you don't feel like you're part of the church, if you don't feel like you know the Lord at this point, but you want to get on board with it, please come see me afterwards. I would love to talk to you about what salvation is and, and how we can get there. Amen? Let's pray. 
Father God, I pray that you would just make us a serving people. I believe that you have. I believe that you've wired that church, this church, that way from the very beginning. I believe that we have it in our DNA to serve. But God, we, we want to multiply. We want to take this to another level. So God, help to make serving not, not some burden that we have to bear, but help to make it a joy. Help to make it a realization in our lives that it's the very thing that we were created for. It's the very reason why we're here, is to serve, to glorify you. Lord, help us as we continue to be in your word. Help us as we continue to, to try to connect with other people in this church. God, give us authentic relationships. Give us a stronger relationship with you. And give us a desire to serve, to pour ourselves out as a drink offering, holy and acceptable to you. Lord, anyone here that doesn't know you, I just pray that you would begin to work in their hearts. That you begin to work repentance in their hearts. That they would turn from the lives that they were living and, and accept the free gift that you offer. Salvation through your son Jesus. We love you and we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go from here, make sure to hug on someone, love on someone before you go. We are a family, remember? Remember? Treat each other like family.